Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, morning. Please feel free to come in, find a, find a seat. I do bid you welcome this morning to Elam. Very special welcome if you're here as a guest or a visitor or for the first time. Just a few quick announcements. If that is you, we will have a Sunday school upstairs shortly after the worship. There'll also be a youth group if you've got teenagers or youth that you would like to send up. And then after the service, we're going to have some refreshments. So please do hang about and just spend a wee bit of time with us at the end. Lovely. Shall we stand? Musical team are just going to lead us into a time of worship, but I was, I was just, um, I was reminded this, this morning of, of a lesson that I once learned from a, a placement student that I had at a previous church, and um, he was he was speaking to me about about Noah's Ark and how the Ark is a picture of Christ, but particularly in his life, it was a picture of worship. And that when we are in the ark of worship, not only are we protected from the flood outside, but as the floods of life start to rise up around us, the ark of worship lifts us as well. And the higher our problems get, the higher we are lifted in that. And I just want to encourage you with that picture this morning as we prepare to, to worship the Lord together. We don't, we don't worship God to escape problems. We don't worship him for, for any benefit that we might get from him. We do it to glorify him. We do it because he, he's worthy of it. But there's no denying the fact that we were built to worship. We were designed to worship. And when we are in that place, we thrive and there is a protection in there there is a, a lifting up and I just want to encourage you this morning I don't know what what the storms of life are, are doing to you right now I don't know what you're battling with what you're dealing with what floods have been coming in but I know that when we are in the ark of Christ and in the ark of worship, however high the floods may rise, we're just lifted up on top of them. In him. So let's just stretch out our hands this morning. A posture of glorification, a posture of surrender. about him this morning. Forget about the flood outside. Forget about the storm. Trying to distract you with the noise. Let's be to be lifted up by lifting him up. We glorify you this morning, Lord. Lord, we've come here to glorify you, to praise the name of Jesus. Lord, when you were with us, you said your worshippers would worship in spirit and in truth. And Lord, you've given us both. Lord Jesus, come and be glorified in this place. Come and be exalted, God, on top of our praise, on top of our thanksgiving. As we honour you, let our worship of you build your throne in this place. Come and be enthroned in our lives, God. Come and have your way this morning. Come and have the battles will be done among us this morning. Lord, challenge us where we need challenging. Encourage those, God, who we need encouraging. Lord, we pray for your healing touch in our, in our bodies, in our souls, in our hearts. transformational process to be at work in us this morning from glory to glory. Lord, we pray that chains would be broken today. Lord, we pray that hearts 
hearts would be mended, that bad attitudes would be challenged and corrected. Lord, may everything else just grow strangely dim as we focus on you. Come have your way, Jesus, and be glorified among us. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz and, and Manny, for speaking out boldly. In case you're maybe unfamiliar, we, um, we believe the Bible when it says the Holy Spirit has given us spiritual gifts, and two of the mentioned gifts is the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation in tongues. And we're told in Scripture, if, if someone gives a, a message in tongues publicly, that we are to wait for an interpretation and we believe by faith that's what was demonstrated this morning so if you've got any questions about that or it's a little bit new feel free to maybe speak to Liz or Manny or myself and we just explain that a wee bit more thank you if you've got your Bibles please turn to Galatians 5.16 um, thank you kids this would be a good time for you to head upstairs kids young people have a good morning. God bless you. Thank you, Jane, for praying earlier for Marion. Marion is home now, isn't she? So thank you, everyone, who's been kind of praying for her. We heard last night that she was admitted to hospital, so naturally we were all praying for the hospital staff who are going to be stuck with her for a few hours. <laughs> but they've pulled through and have sent her home. Galatians 5.16, if you have it. There's Bibles at the back in case you've come without one today or in case yours is, your battery's died on it. Continuing our look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Um, and over the last few weeks, we've been looking at this, uh, these different roles that the Spirit does, and each week we're getting a broader and broader look at just just how busy he is. We've looked at the Holy Spirit as a, as a giver of life to us, as a, as a giver of gifts, as a producer of fruit, and as a convictor of sin and righteousness to us. Well, the message this morning is that the Holy Spirit helps us overcome the flesh. The Holy Spirit helps us overcome the flesh. When you gave your life to Jesus, if you have given your life to Jesus, you were immediately, in that moment, saved from the penalty of your sin. It, it, it's, it's a past tense thing. It happened. When you got saved, you became saved from the penalty of your sin. And as you continue to abide in Christ and, and walk with Christ, you are continually saved from the power of sin. And one day, when Jesus finally returns, you'll be set free from the presence of sin. It's that second one that we're going to focus on this morning, the one the Holy Spirit is currently helping us with, being saved from the power of sin. It's an ongoing work. It's a current work. This is what the Bible means when it says that we are saved and we are being saved. Because although we are saved, our salvation won't be completed until Jesus is with us. Noah was in the ark, and when he was in the ark, he was saved from the flood. But he wasn't completely saved from the flood until the flood was gone, until he was pitching his tent on the slopes again with no water around him. Right now, we are safe and secure in Christ our Ark, but there is still a flood of sin in the world and, and that flood of sin still seeks to disrupt our lives affect our lives and affect our walk with God but thankfully we have the Holy Spirit helping us to live in such a way to minimise the damage and the impact that sin can have in our lives till Christ returns Galatians 5.16 let's just look at it together so I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, 
in the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. And they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. For the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'll stop there. Let me ask you, do, do you think you would notice if you had someone in your life who was just fully committed to derailing and distracting you from your walk with God? Like an undercover agent who's been assigned just to you to come into your life disguised as a friend to walk with you, be with you, seduce you, all in order to sabotage your relationship with Jesus. You'd like to think that if we did have someone sneaking about our life like that, that we'd become aware of it, that, that we'd, we'd get wise to it, that we'd notice, hey, all the advice this buddy's given me, you know, is really quite self-serving and not, not Christ-serving. Every, every, every activity he, he leads me into um, turns out to not be so great for me. There, there's no eternal good that seems to be coming from this. You'd like to think that if you had a saboteur in your life like that, that you'd soon become wise to them and you'd soon get rid. And the reason I'm saying this is because the truth is, you, you kind of do. You, you kind of do ha have a saboteur in your life who is hell-bent on destroying your relationship with God. And he lives right in here. In your heart. The Bible's got several names for this enemy. Sometimes he's called the old man. Sometimes he's called the sinful nature. But the most common title he's given is the flesh. And in a sense, the flesh is perhaps the most dangerous enemy you have. Certainly not as powerful as the devil or his demons, but at least they only come after you once in a while. And they only come after you, really, if you're trying to do some real good for Jesus. But the flesh, that's there all the time. You can't switch that off. That's going to be, you're going to be dragging that around with you till the day you die. And there's not really a moment in this life where we're truly free of it. Remember, it's when Christ returns and we are with him and made like him that we are finally saved from the presence of sin. So, so what is it exactly? What, what is the flesh? The Bible chucks this word around quite a bit, and, and I think we often think, oh, flesh, carnal, sexy time, that kind of stuff, you know, very fleshy. But it's, it's so much broader than that. The flesh is that part of ourselves that is fallen and, and sinful, it's that part of our nature that, that desires more than anything just to live independently of God and of his rule. When God made Adam and Eve, the, the human, the, the prototypes, they, they didn't have sinful natures. God didn't make them sinful. They, they were made in the image of their, their heavenly father. They were made Christ-like, if you will. But then they disobeyed God deliberately and intentionally and, and sin entered into them and they were changed. The, the eternal life that they had was, was changed for a spiritual death. Their Christ-like natures that they inherited from their, their spiritual father were, were corrupted and were replaced with something that was totally selfish and totally sinful. 
and s changed so much that scripture des describes us as this. It says, the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. When God made us, he said, it is good. And after sin entered, the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And because this happened to Adam and Eve, the, the first in the line, every other poor soul was just born into it. It became part of our spiritual DNA. And we see this, don't we? Have you ever noticed how you don't need to teach children to be naughty? You just, you know, sometimes Elsie does these weak and acute, cheeky, naughty things. And I say, yeah, there it is. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You know, you don't need to teach a two-year-old to hit another child, steal their toy, and then lie about it to your face. You just, you just, you don't need to teach them. It's there. It's built into it. You need to teach them to be good. You need to teach them to apologize and share and, and tell the truth. You know, that's the stuff that's unnatural to them. They're just born. We're just born into it. We're born with it in us. And, and that's, that's the flesh. And it's progressive. Adam and Eve's worst sin that we know of was that they, they ate a piece of fruit. But their firstborn son, Cain, murdered his own brother. Think about that. The very first human being born of a woman was a killer. That's how hungry and, and corrosive the sinful nature is. In us, that in just one generation, humanity went from stealing fruit to killing family members. It's a picture of just how quickly sin escalates and entangles us. And, and from that point on, you know, we've not exactly had a glorious track record as a species, have we? War, invasions, genocide, racial subjugation. Sexual exploitation, human slavery, animal slavery, child slavery. These are just a few of the, the sinful nature's highlight reels. And they're all pretty bad. But just to rein it in a wee bit, it, it would be a mistake to think that, that the goal of the flesh is just to cause as much destruction globally as possible. The, the sinful nature in you isn't waking up in the morning saying, let's start a war, let's enslave people. It's a lot more subtle than that. And the objective of the flesh, the ministry of the flesh, if you will, can be summed up in three simple words. Me, me, me. That's it. More than anything, more than anything, your flesh wants you to put you first. More than anything, it just wants you to look after number one. You need to be secure. You need to be all right. You, you deserve your, your piece of the pie. You know, maybe it's time to look inward for a bit rather than upward or outward. What about you? The message of the flesh is, if it feels good, you should do it. If you want it, you should be able to take it. The important thing is that you are looked after. Numero uno, more than anything, your flesh wants you to be the king or queen of your own life, to sit in the throne of your own heart, unchallenged. And while you in this new era of self-care and self-love, that may not sound immediately like the worst thing ever. Actually, it probably is the single most destructive thing we can do because we were designed to live and to serve under the direct rule of God. That's where we were built to be, that's where we are designed to, to thrive and to prosper. 
and, and to find life like a flower under the rain. Living independently of God, trying to reject his rule, his reign, trying to put ourselves on the throne of our own life it, it is, like, is like a fish trying to escape the ocean because it's fed up, you know, playing the, playing the game of the waves. It's not going to work. It's toxic to us to live independently of God, not to have him exactly where he wants to be. But unfortunately, this is exactly what our sinful natures desire. Independence from God. Sovereignty over your own life to make your own decisions, regardless of what people say is right and wrong. Even if it means unfulfillment, unforgiveness, and eternal damnation. Like I said at the beginning, the flesh is probably the most dangerous enemy that you have. That's what the flesh is. That's what the flesh is all about. But this this is not supposed to be a message about the flesh. It's supposed to be a message about the Holy Spirit working in our lives to overcome the flesh. And this is where we need to realize an, an important truth regarding the spirit in the flesh and that is that they don't like each other they don't get on at all look look at what Paul says verse 17 for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other the spirit and the flesh are constantly going to be opposed to each other in your life. What they want for you is the exact opposite of each other. The spirit of God in your life wants you to put God first so that you'll have that abundant life. The flesh wants you to put you first, even if it kills you. The spirit wants you to deny yourself so that you might magnify Christ and be fulfilled in that the flesh wants you to magnify yourself even if it means denying Christ and losing out on eternal life they're polar opposites and for this reason they they oppose each other it's like they're it's like they're at war within you And, and and surely you've noticed it Surely you, you, you've felt it, this internal battle. You walk out of a shop and, and you realise that the shopkeeper gave you £20 change instead of £10 change. And the spirit convicts you. And he says, come on now, and you know, you know, I need to go back in the shop and just say, here, mate, you gave me 20 instead of 10, there's your, there's your 10 back. You, you know that that's the right thing to do. But something in you just doesn't let you turn around. You've been a follower of Jesus forever, but in that moment, you're honestly willing to just ignore him and and sell your integrity for a free tenor. Or you're sitting watching something alone one night and something comes on that that you know, oh, I shouldn't be watching this. And and you'd be really, really embarrassed if, if we all knew that you were watching this and and you just got that, sm- that still small voice just turn it off turn it off change the channel but something in you just wants to see where this is going it's a battle you're driving home one night and and you clip the wing mirror off a parked car and no one saw it nobody knows except the lord and, and you know what the Bible says about property damage and, and restitution and all that. And you know that the right thing to do, the, the, the road to blessing and honouring God here, is just to turn around, leave a know it. But it's hard to turn around, isn't it? I, I can live with a conviction, can't I? God's not going to smite me. It's a battle. It's a battle when it comes to doing the right thing, to doing the sacrificial thing. Anything that, that encroaches on that me, me, me 
anything that steps in the flesh's territory of us worshipping ourselves and putting us in, in first place becomes a battle. Because we've been rooted in this old nature for so long. It's at war with the new nature that the Holy Spirit's forming in us. And you know, it's, it's not even just to do with ethical things, moral things, things like that. You know, in my experience, most of the time, it's, it's to do with devotional stuff. It's to do with when I try and push towards God. That's where the real battles start. I say the real battles, not that they're, not that they're sensational or extravagant, but just consistent and steady, and subtle, and undermining. I'm probably the only person that this has ever happened to, but sometimes I sit down to pray, and as soon as I sit down to pray, I need to check my phone, or I need to just put the kettle on so that I've got a cup of tea for the prayer, or I need a poo suddenly. Where'd that come from? It's not that time of the day. Again, probably only me, but sometimes I get to the evening and it's like, okay, time to stop work, kids are in bed, time to chill, watch a bit of TV, and then I see my Bible sitting there and I'm like, I've not done my morning devotions yet. How have I went all day? And you know you've been trying to, but just little things keep popping up. You ever notice how easy it is to be, to be late for church? Or even sometimes just to skip church entirely? even though you would never dream of being late for work. You've never been late for work a day in your life. But you've never been on time for church a day in your life either. <laughs> so either, in your mind, your employer is more honour-worthy than Jesus, or there's something else going on. Something just at odds with anything you do to prioritise Jesus niggling away, distracting, derailing. I, d I don't know, maybe I'm over-spiritualizing things, but, you know, six days of the week, our kids are up before the sunshine, and they're just up, and they're ready to go straight away. So we're up, and they're ready to go. See, on a Sunday, they like a lie-in. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that is. Is that the flesh in them? Is it the flesh in, is that the devil? Why are Sunday mornings a battle? Sometimes it just feels like something is working against us. Whenever we try and take those steps towards God, those small, steady, consistent steps that we know are going to help us thrive, sometimes it just feels like something is, is working against us. And, and there is. It's the flesh. He doesn't want us moving towards God because the call of God is to crucify the flesh, to deny yourself. As John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he must increase. And so the, the flesh wars with the Spirit of God in our life, fighting for our attention, pulling us in the exact opposite direction of whatever the Spirit of God is leading us in. And so how do we ensure that when we experience this inner battle, that the right side wins? How do we make sure that we, are, that we are able to follow through on the call of the Spirit and not the flesh? We've kind of already read the answer to that. Verse 18, I say to you, walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walking in the Spirit is the solution to walking in the flesh. Being filled with the Spirit is the cure to being filled with self. I had two minds about doing this, but I'm going to, I'm going to try, and, and try and show you a little bit of a demonstration of how this works. Um, Debs, Pete, can I call you up please as volunteers? No. Our elders, ladies and gentlemen. Beauty and the Beast, as they're known <laughs> at the session meetings. Um, if you, you just stay there a wee moment. Um, 
this is my sinful nature. <laughs> this is my flesh. He's my undercover agent who's been assigned to me to mess up my life and, and mess up my walk with God should I ever decide to start one. And you want to just, um, let's just, let's just do a step forward a wee bit. Um, me and my sinful nature, we are joined at the hip. We, we were in the womb together. And he, he's a big lad, isn't he? That's because I, I've been feeding him a lot. He just keeps on telling me where to go. He's been, you've been my guide and star all these years, helping me keep myself safe, making sure I'm looked after, making sure that I get what I want and that I'm satisfied in all the things that I do. And you, you just lead me around and I just keep letting you, I just keep giving you the authority. And that's fed you and you've got bigger and bigger, making you stronger. But some of the things, I've got to be honest, some of the things that you've led me into, I don't think have, have worked out so well for me and have actually caused me a bit of grief and a bit of pain and a bit of despair. And in my despair, I tried something new. I cried out to God for help. And God answered. Thank you. <laughs> and God gave me the gospel gave me the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ and even gave me his Holy Spirit to come into my life and be with me, the seal of my salvation. And now there's three of us <laughs> in this relationship. And, and, and you can see something happening here. You know, my, I don't know why, but things are getting a wee bit harder. Suddenly there's a little bit of a battle going on and I thought it would be easy just to kind of go along and, and walk this spiritual road and, and be fulfilled and have everything that the people in church say I can have. But actually, it's a little bit difficult because, you, because the Spirit of God, you know, she, she's saying, come, in, come with me, come and pray with me, let's go to church. But actually, this guy's making it pretty difficult. He doesn't want me doing that. And, and this is where so many of us live our Christian life in that tug of war. When, when you hit that wing mirror, when it's hard to get up for church on a Sunday morning, when, when that TV program comes on, you know you shouldn't be watching. You're stuck in the middle of this, this conflict, this tug of war. And, and you feel torn in two sometimes. And some days you have a bit of victory. And some days you're piled in shame because you're, you're in defeat. And it's hard. And, and I need to know how to deal with this fella. And what we sometimes do in this situation is we, we try and assert ourselves. And we get a wee bit of willpower about us. And we think, I'm not going to be, yeah, I don't want to be an addiction anymore. I don't want to be watching pornography anymore. I don't want to be full of unforgiveness anymore. So what we tend to do is we go, I'm, I'm going to deal with this. And we, we think we can deal with you and push you out the way and wrestle with you and break free from you. But actually, this isn't getting me anywhere. All I'm doing now, I'm actually getting pretty tired wrestling with this same old sin, this same old addiction all the time. And, and you're not going anywhere. You're not getting smaller. I'm not getting free of you. I'm, I'm stuck with you until Christ comes back. What do I do? Well, Paul tells us what to do. He says, walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It's not about, it's not about me making you my focus and fighting you and overcoming you. I can't overcome you. I, I'm not the saviour. I've got a saviour. My job actually is to turn my back on you a little bit and forget about you and pour all my energy into walking in the spirit. And I say, I am going to pray. I am going to make time to pray. I'll turn my phone off if I need to. I'll hold my poo in if I need to. I am going to go to church. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to find God in your coming with me this time. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Give me a round of applause. That's just, uh, it's a bit of a picture of what the internal battle between the flesh and the spirit feels like, a battle that we're stuck in the middle of. But it's a battle, the outcome of which is decided by us. Ultimately, walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If we follow the urges of the flesh 
as Paul says, it leads deeper and deeper into more horrendous sins and further and further away from actually where the Spirit of God is wanting us to be. And if we choose to try and overcome the flesh in our own strength, all we're going to do is exhaust ourselves fighting something that we couldn't defeat previously, and we're just going to end up exhausted and discouraged. And that's where a lot of people get stuck, I think, get stuck in the merry-go-round of trying to deal with their own problems. 19th century evangelist D.L. Moody once gave uh, an example of this exact point. He, he was giving a talk once to a bunch of students. They were physics students. And he asked them to discuss the most efficient way to remove all of the oxygen from a glass vessel. And he allowed them to discuss it. And they, they came back to him and they said, well, the most effective way, the, the longest term solution would be to, to completely seal it onto a suction device, which would draw all of the oxygen out and keep it sealed forever. And then it will be completely free from any trace of oxygen permanently. And, and Moody said, yeah, that would certainly remove the oxygen for a while. But eventually the vacuum that you've created, the, the pressure of the emptiness inside would eventually cause the glass to crack. And all the stuff that you've tried to force out would just rush back in again. And I've seen people over the years crack because they've been putting all of their energy into trying to force sin out of their life, whether it be lust or greed or anger or unforgiveness or addiction or whatever, by trying to starve their desires or by trying to get counselling around their, their desires, or by trying to punish themselves for their desires. And all it really achieved was you just ended up with a follower of Jesus more focused on their own failure than they were on their own saviour. And it exhausted them. And it left them empty. And eventually they would crack, they would succumb to temptation, they'd end up back at square one, only this time they were in a worse position because this time they tried really, really hard and they failed anyway. D.L. Moody later went on to show students that the best way to get the air out of the glass was simply to fill it with something else. To fill it with something more substantial and let that push the air out. We need to remember that the call of God on our lives is not to empty ourselves of sin, but to be filled with him. Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk on wine, but keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is the solution to being filled with the flesh. Walking in the Spirit is the key to victory over your sinful nature. If you're struggling with lustful thoughts or vengeful thoughts or malicious thoughts or destructive thoughts or, or tempting thoughts, choosing not to think about that stuff just isn't going to be enough for you. Choosing to, to tackle them head on just gives them more of your focus and more of your time and more of your energy. Instead, we, we turn our back on the snares of the flesh and we fix our eyes fully on Jesus, moving towards him. What does the old song say? Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace when you spend your time focusing on, on the flaws of the flesh and your mistakes and the things that you cannot overcome they just look bigger 
Goliath always looks bigger the closer you're standing to him. But when we focus on Jesus, they grow strangely dim. Have you been focusing your energies on the wrong thing this morning? Have you been trying to overcome the flesh without relying on the one who actually fights your battles? Have you been trying to force your own sanctification, force your own holiness with nothing but willpower and determination? If any is of If any of us could do that, we wouldn't have needed a saviour in the first place. You don't get rid of the dark by rebuking the dark. You get rid of it by turning the light on. What did Joseph do when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife? He turned his back on her. He ran from her and he made it all about God. He made the situation about God. He said, how could I do such a thing and sin against God? You want victory over sin? Make it about God. You want to stop looking at the wrong things? Start looking at the right thing. You want to stop going to the wrong places? Plant your knees in the right place. Amen. Amen. A Sunday school teacher once gave her class uh, a little lesson to do. She gave them all a, a sheet of paper and said, I want you to write down everything you've learned this year about Jesus. And then on the other side of it, I want you to write down everything you've learned this year about the devil. And she gave them 20 minutes to do it, and the kids wrote away. And then she collected them in at the end to share the, the answers and one little girl came up very sheepishly and visibly upset, saying, I made a mistake, I got it wrong, I, I'm sorry. And she said, how, how did you get it wrong? How can you possibly get this wrong? And she says, I, I just had so much stuff I wanted to say about Jesus that I used both sides of my paper. So when the time came for the devil, there was just no room left for him. <laughs> the little girl got it right, in my opinion. Fill your life with Jesus. Fill your focus with Jesus. Fill your your pursuits with Jesus. And there'll be no room left for the devil. Walk in the spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Shall we stand? Let our music team back up just as we pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning, God. And Lord, well, I speak as someone who has spent years and years trying to overcome the flesh in the power of the flesh, trying to overcome sin in my life without fully relying on the one who defeated sin. Lord, well, I just pray for anyone here this morning who's been listening to this, who has been fighting a losing battle, who's been struggling and struggling, going around the same mountain, been taunted by the same Goliath, and doesn't know how to have the victory. Lord, the enemy loves to make us feel guilty about that. He loves to make us feel ashamed about that, so that we don't turn back to you. Lord, I pray for anyone here who's in that place, you would just pour out your grace on them right now. You pour out your mercy. Pour out your love. Speak to their soul, God, and let them know that you still want them. That they're still called and chosen and loved by you. You know, God, that when we try and overcome the flesh and the power of the flesh, that it's because we're trying to do right and to try and honour you. But we've got it all backwards. Help us, God, to be a people who put you first. Not a people obsessed with being holy, but a people obsessed with the Holy One. (coughs) A people whose focus and priority and vision is set squarely on you, God, so that all the other giants and floods and storms and temptations fall into the background and lose their power over us.
Father, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to come right now and remind us again who you are. Remind us again how and to what such great capacity you are here for us. Remind us again that you are deeply interested in every battle we fight and every problem that's holding us back and every temptation that would try and rob our vision from you. Come Holy Spirit and open our eyes to just how much you want us to focus on you, to how fulfilled and strengthened and encouraged you want us to be in you. Lord, we pray that you pour oil into our lamps this morning pour oil into our soul, set us ablaze for you once again. Well, there's people here, God, who are down to a smouldering wick, people here who are down to a a bruised reed. Your word says you will not break. Strengthen us this morning, God. Excite us and encourage us back to you so that the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. Amen. (coughs) Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Good, good, good. Uh, Please take your seats. We've come to the end of our our service now. Just a couple of quick announcements, first of all. Um, As always, there's an offering box at the end there um, for anyone who's come looking to give this morning. Um... Next week we have our, our fun day, which is down at, down at Mark and Becky's farm. All going well, we'll have good weather. Um, but if it gets to a point where it looks like it's not going to be good weather, we will let you know in advance. But um, ideally, there'll be no service here, and that is where we'll be going. And then the week after that is the Hope Now All Church Service. Lauren, you just pass me that flyer, please. I'll just wave it so people... Um, if you want to grab, have a look at this flyer <coughs> that's at the back. It's a weekend evangelistic outreach that's taking place in town by Calvary Chapel, Friday through to Sunday. You'll see them around if they're about. They'll, they'll probably be doing line dancing and stuff like that, round about Marks and Spencers and just doing lots of mad stuff. Um, so I'm sure they'd love it if you went and said hi. They'll be down Crescent Gardens and doing different things. But on Sunday... They're doing an all-church service, inviting all the churches and all the Christians in Harrogate to go and do one big service. That's going to be at 10 o'clock down at Crescent Gardens near the bandstand. So that's where we're going to be. We won't be here. So uh, do, do come out and join in that with us. And it, it's kind of getting to that time of year again where I have to mention something about membership. We, we have a partnership program here at the church and... If, if, if you're in a position where you're not a partner with us, but, but you've been coming here kind of well over six months now, and you're coming regularly, and uh, you <coughs> think maybe that's maybe the next step for you in sort of settling yourself, and if you feel this is where God wants you now for the, for the next season, then please do come and talk to him about that. And we can just talk through what that means and see if it's something that would be right for you. But... Um, Otherwise, let us have some refreshments. Is Park Brew officially finished now for summer? No. 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 <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. A couple more Park Brews anyway. Um, Wednesday morning prayer meeting, obviously, at 10 o'clock at that. So if you're free on Wednesdays, do come and join us for that. Um, good. Thank you. Let's have some, some fellowship and some refreshments now.